when people look in at boxing, they think of the big, big names and they think of the big, big purses. But what they don't realise is 90, probably 97, 98% of fighters fight for less than minimum wage. There's no money in it at all. When I fought for the British title, I got paid nine grand. Trained away in London. I made a loss on that fight. You know, you pay your manager, you pay your trainer. So there's no money in boxing at all. It has to be a passion. You know, and I, and I, I'd, have, I'd have fought Dan Hamilton for free. I'd have had most of my fights for free. Um, it was all about progression with me and trying to reach that ultimate goal of being the British champion. I'm sure it's very different off field and out of the ring, how you kind of wound down, how you kind of use your, your free time. Is that fair? Yeah, definitely. I mean, and also as well, you're talking about two completely different periods of my life. You know, I started playing professional football at 17 years of age and retired at 26. So they're, they're the days that you, you party, aren't they? You know, that you, you, en you enjoy a few beers and, and stuff like that. So, you know, to wind down after a football game, it'd be quick shower, back to the apartment, quick change of clothes and, and straight out. And I played in the area where that was that was the norm. You know, when you used to go out after games, you went just out just you and a couple of mates. It was a whole squad. So so yeah, that was how I would kind of unwind after games. Um but yeah, then when you fast forward to boxing, I'm a little bit older and I'm a little bit wiser and the game's a little bit more serious as well. You know, you can't go into a professional boxing match um, when you've been out partying. It's a dangerous, dangerous sport. So, yeah, the, the, the chalk and cheese really vary how prepared from one to the other. You had, a, you had a, a very good football career, the kind of career that most kids could only dream of, right, in terms of you made it, you made it to the Premier League, you made it to England under-21s. You know, you were captain of Sheffield United when you were 19. You, you know, you you did you lived the dream, if you like. But you, as you say, you're of an era where you could also enjoy yourself and it was just pre-social media as well. I mean, would you change what you had then? And I know you fell out of love with it in the end, but what would you change what you had when you were living the dream, if you like, to the way it is now with what young players have today? Yeah, I mean, you, you look back in my day, it was, it was a bit like the uh, the Wild West, really. You know, I remember when I signed my, signed my, first, um, my first deal with Sheffield United and all of a sudden was earning, you know, big, big money. There was no kind of guidance about to deal with that or anything like that. Um, I signed my, I was living in digs at the time, so I signed my deal. Next day I woke up, woke up um, with thousands of pounds in my account. Um, so, yeah, there's no no guidance. So that I think that's one thing that's changed massively and, and it's a really big thing for the young kids coming through now that have to deal with the finances that, that being a professional footballer brings. So I definitely changed that side. I'd, I'd welcome the support network that the players get now. So I think it just gives you a better opportunity to have longevity in your career and have people around you that are better decision makers than 17, 18, 19 year old lads. Um, so I definitely changed that. There's no camera phones in my day. Um, when I first remember David, I don't think mobiles were out. So, there was, you know, that's one thing I, I wouldn't like to think what footage you'd be around now of me if there was camera phones around. So, no, I, I definitely wouldn't change that part of things. And, you know, I, I don't want to sound too old because I am only 40, but back in my day, you could you could go and sit in the local pub or the pub on the corner from the ground, you know, and you could have a beer with normal people, with fans, and and and, and it, it wasn't really that much of a big deal. Um, but now all that's changed, and I, and I think the money in the game has taken the players further away from the fans what they've ever been. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, when you're talking one area to the next, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't swap my area, no, because I think we had the best of both worlds. Um, mm. You know, the players now are so much fitter and miles better athletes. I'm not sure if they're actual better football players. I don't, I'm not sure we're, we're producing better players than what we did 20, 30 years ago, but they're definitely more professional. When you're a footballer, you're allowed to enjoy it as well, you know. You know, and I, and I think that gets, you don't, you, you have to find a happy medium for me. And uh, yeah, no, no, my era certainly did that. You know, it was not a drinking culture. 
because we weren't drunk all the time, but <laughs> definitely a couple of days a week, all the lads would be out together. And like I said, it wasn't just you and a couple of the players. It was a squad thing. There'd be 20 of you out at times. And yeah, it was brilliant. And you, you I, yeah, to answer your question, I wouldn't change my era. It was, I loved it, you know. And even though I, I played for nine years professionally, I retired at 26. And towards the end, I did fall out of love with it. But I've also got loads of great memories and met some great lads. And a lot of that, that, them great memories you have are in the pub, you know, after a, ge- <laughs> after a game, celebrating a, a, a victory. And, and you don't see that anymore. And I think that's a massive, um, you know, like I said, the game's been taken away from the, from the man on the street. In terms of when you, when you were playing, did you have any other hobbies? I mean, socialising, being a young lad and, and enjoying everything that goes with that, just, that's fair enough. I and mean, I think you're right. I think that's been lost a little bit. You know, you are living the dream. You should be able to enjoy it and that should come across. You're learning a lot of lifestyle skills when you're mixing with older pros and you're going out and you're bonding and you're mixing with people. You're dealing with people. A lot of these young players now, it's hard for them. It's not their fault, but they'll struggle to mix with normal people. Yeah, definitely. And I agree, it isn't their fault. And, you know, Managing at the level I manage at, we mm. we take on loan a lot of young pros that have that are kind of on the fringe of the first team. So I, I get to work with them quite a lot, and 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 they're a different breed of people these days. You know that they, they they haven't got great people skills because mm. they're not they don't have to learn quickly. You know, as a young pro in a football environment, in the back in my day, again without sounding too old. You better learn on the job really quickly, otherwise you'll be out the team and, and, and ostracised. So you have to grow up really quick. Um, and a lot of these young lads now at pro clubs, they just don't have the people skills. I just, and you know what? I, I, I don't think it's a football thing. I think it's a society thing as well. You know, it, it the world's changing, isn't it? And uh, not all change is good. Like I said, there's loads of good things that the modern era has brought in, but I think we've lost a lot of core values as well. But yeah, to answer your question, hobbies outside of football, none. Didn't I don't I don't play golf. Um, I, I don't play snooker. None of that. Um, my hobbies were socialising, really. Yeah. Um, I like to drink and I like a bet. So you could either find me in the pub or the bookies. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, listen, when when you moved into boxing. And again, it's a it's a brutal story. It's a brilliant story, and, and you, you, you're right. In and you, I know you've said it. It'll never be matched what you did in terms of the British title and everything else. Incredible, seven years ago, isn't it? But when you moved into boxing, what changed outside? You've you've then said goodbye to all your rich mates, all your rich football mates. You've then gone to a totally different world that we we understand. You know what I mean? And, what changed outside of, of that environment, that sporting environment, when you were, you were then a jobbing fighter trying to learn your trade, getting beaten up every day? Yeah, and like you said, you know, when people look in at boxing, they think of the big, big names and they think of the big, big purses. But what they don't realise is 90, probably 97, 98% of fighters fight for less than min- minimum wage. There's no money in it at all. You know, I, I for 95% of my career, my purses were two and a half grandish. Um, you know, the biggest fight of my career that when I fought for the British title, I got paid nine grand to fight Darren Hamilton, uh, mm. top of the bill on Sky Sports. 12 round, 12 round, uh, 12 week training camp, trained away in London. I made a loss on that fight. You know, you pay your manager, you pay your trainer, so there's no money in boxing at all. It has to be a passion, you know. And I and I, I'd, have, I'd have fought Darren Hamilton for free, I'd have had most of my fights for free. Um, it was all about progression with me and trying to reach that ultimate goal of being the British champion. You know, the 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 unthinkable, really. Even now, seven years since that day, when people speak to me, that that's all they talk about. So, the the amount of money I earned from that fight or from my whole boxing career is irrelevant. When I die, that's what they'll talk about me yeah. winning the British title. Um, so you can't put a price on that. Uh, what what changed for me was maturity, really, just just evolution of of a man, you know, and and that's what that's what changed for me. I just grew up, and and there's only so many um, nightclubs you can go into, and strip clubs you can go into before you, they get a bit boring, you know, and uh, and like I said, I and then I uh, I then started to have a family of my own, um, just evolution. And also, as well, and I know this will sound really, really arrogant, 
I could go out two or three weeks. I could go out two or three days during the week, sorry, as a footballer, and still perform on, on a Saturday because I was good enough to box in when I started. I was ranked 189th in Great Britain out of 189. Mm. So I was the worst fighter in Great Britain in my weight category. And I was there on merit. I was the worst. So I didn't have that luxury of being able to take my foot off the gas, maybe miss training, go out Saturday, Sunday on the lash and then think, well, I won't train Monday, Tuesday. I'll go back in Wednesday. I just did not have that luxury because I wasn't very good. So Mm. I had to really, really dedicate myself and live the life. And I was forced to do that because of my lack of ability. So, and I recognize that I I, I was not in the boxing gym thinking, oh God, I'm brilliant. You know, I was getting beat up every day. So Mm. the proof was in the pudding. Um, So yeah, just evolution of a man and realization of where I was in my career that I wasn't very good made me really, really dedicate myself. And then losing my dad, that that played a massive, that had a massive impact on everything. Um, Because, you know, like I made the promise to my dad on when it literally 30 seconds before he died that I'd, I'd, I'd win the British title. So that, that made him, that, that was a big impact on me because I didn't want the last thing I said to my dad to not happen. So I really knuckled down and really made the sacrifices. Um, but you know, I, I'm, I, it's taken me a long, long time to mature as a person. Um, I probably don't, don't think I found my way until I was probably 30 until I started to feel comfortable in my own skin, to know what I'm all about. took me a long time. Some people have got it nailed at 21, 25. They know what life's all about. And you look at me, you think, wow, well, he's playing professional football. He's playing the Premier League. He's got it absolutely sussed. I didn't know my ass from my elbow until I was probably 30. And that's when I kind of feel like I grew into myself and and knew what I was all about. So probably just evolution, you know, just growing Mm. up and, and, making loads of mistakes and you know it, like everyone everyone knows now by the time I was 26 years of age I'd been arrested 21 times um and from 26 to now I think I've had a parking ticket and that's about it so you know it just shows how I've yeah. uh, evolved and how boxing's helped me really that, that's the thing that everyone talks about boxing though about respect and discipline and it's normally leveled at kids when they're 14 15 16 get in the gym it'll put you on the right path you know, you were on the, you were you were living the dream as a footballer, getting all sorts of mither, but then you're 26 and boxing straightens you out at that age. It just shows you the power of the sport. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, you know, I, I love boxing, but I wouldn't credit all to boxing. Mm. I take a big chunk of credit myself as well, you know, because you, you have to become accountable for the decisions you make. And and that's what I started to do, is just trying to be a little bit accountable to what I'm doing. And, mm. you know, every time I'd been in trouble, it'd been because I'd been drunk. You know, I, I, and out partying, drunk, and end up in fights, this, that, and the other. So once you become a professional boxer, you, you, you're not drinking anymore. Yeah. So all of a sudden, I'm making better decisions because I'm not drunk. So that was a big part of it as well. I, you know, I don't I'm not a drinker anymore. I've drank enough booze in my football years to last me two lifetimes. So, you know, very, very rarely do you find me. I like a little bottle of wine every now and again. But, yeah, but yeah I think just life changes, isn't it? We all grow yeah. up. We all... We all get old. Some some people, you know what? They never find their way. Yeah. Some people find it at twenty one. Some people like myself have to waste a career and have things fall fall apart around them to find their way. And yeah, I think probably about thirty years of age, I I found my way. Yeah, but it's all part of the learning process, isn't it? And you know, I'm not going to get too deep about it, but everything you've done has, has led you to where you are. You you uh, what? You're British Empire medal now. I am. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. These things, you know, it all it all gets it all sorts itself out in a way, doesn't it? And and from what you've learned, you've gone back into football. I know you've just left again, against for Trinity. But what what led you back in, and what's the plan now with with the football? Then that you fell out of love with, but the managing side of it got you back in again. Well, I never really fell out of love with football, even though I say I did. I never really fell out of love with it. It it it's it's. I've got a real difficult relationship with football because. I mean, I'm very, very. You very, very rarely see interviews of me talking about my football career because it's just something I don't like talking about. Um, because I haven't got many great memories from it. I just look back at it as just a massive waste of a of an opportunity which I underachieved in. So I never really talk about my football career, and I just fell out of love with it because it was. I dreamt of playing for Liverpool in England when I was a kid. John Barnes was my hero. 
That's what I wanted to do. I played for England under 16s, 18s, 21s. And I thought my career was heading towards, you know, playing at the top level. So to then wake up one morning and you're playing away at Leighton Orient on a Tuesday night in front of 500 people, that wasn't the dream. Mm. So that hit me hard. And, and so I was more angry with, with football. But I still love the game. I love it. And football is my expertise. You know, every, everyone talks about winning the British title, but I just did that through hard work and, you know, mm. bloody mindedness. Not even any... any you, I, I spy my 17-year-old son who's never boxed and he boxes my ears off. And he's never, I'm not even, I'm useless at boxing. I'm not very good. I'm just determined. Well, that's, a bit, that's a bit of nonsense. Come on. You, you can't do well, what you do with not being, without having some talent. I get what you're saying about your work rate and your fitness and all that, but there was some talent there. Come on. Yeah, cool. well, yeah, definitely. I, I, I had little bits here and there, but I can't think of too many spas I went into where I outboxed people or, or, yeah, well, that, that's, out... that's a big game player, isn't it? That's a big game player. Leave it in the gym. <laughs> yeah, but but, lo but loads of times my trainers were like a week before the fight were like, "How do you feel?" I'm like, "Yeah, I feel okay." Like <laughs> sparring's been awful. We've been, you've been getting beat up for six weeks. But the thing is, with me sparring with 16 ounce gloves on and a big head guard just didn't suit my style. You know, I needed to get close to you and try and hurt you and rough you up and 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 impose myself a little bit really not until I got further on in my development where I started to think actually I've got a decent jab and I, and I could do things um but really I, I got there by just bloody mindedness and determination and refusing to give up whereas football I got there on pure talent um so football is my expertise you know mm. boxing is kind of like a little bit on the side that's no good for me but <laughs> I just needed to scratch that itch but football's always been my expertise. It's it's what I know. It's what I love. Yeah. Um, I just have a really difficult relationship with football. But that's only playing. I love yeah. managing. I love people. I love being around players. So, yeah, my, my football management, I, I believe that, you know, it's funny how things work out, really. I always thought, like I said, I was going to play for Liverpool and England. I believe my real calling is going to be in football management. Mm -hmm. I feel that's where I'm going to really excel because of all the lessons I've learned over 15, 20 years in professional sport, two completely different sports, what I've learned is people. And that's what football management is, dealing with people. Um, and that's where, you know, everywhere I've been, I, I've done a good job. Um, so I'm ready for that next step up. I'm ready to let, be let off the leash and I, I want my opportunity in league football. And, and once I do, th there's no doubt in my mind that I'll go to the top. Well, with what you've done, you're going to do it, aren't you? You know, if, you, if, you, if your mind's that, that way. And I know you've got all your badges, haven't you? Yeah, I went and did all my badges. I'm, I'm fully qualified. I wanted to leave no excuses to say no to me. Um, so I've gone and done my apprenticeship. I've now managed in steps eight, seven, six, five, four, and three. So no one can label mm, lacking experience, no qualifications. I've done all of that. So now it's just a case of, I believe I've... I, I, I deserve a chance. You know, mm -hmm. it's not a case of me saying, oh, please give me a chance, sir. I've deserved my chance. I've gone out, I've done the hard yards and I've been successful. So yeah. I deserve it and I'm ready. And once I get the opportunity, the rest will be history. So in the meantime, yeah, I mean, I know you're, you're busy and you've got, you're, you're helping fellas get fit and all the rest of it. So tell us a bit about that and what else you're doing now before you get that, that next step into football management. Well, yeah, once I retired from boxing, like most boxers, I started to look down at my belly and I was no longer anywhere near 10 stone, never mind 10 stone seven or light middle weight. I started to look a hell of a lot like a cruiserweight and I'm only five foot six. So I put on plenty of weight and I, I run my own boxing gym in Driffield and uh, the PT there called, called Josh. I said to him, listen, you need to get me back in shape. And he's like, I'm ready whenever you are. So every week this was going on for like six months it was a running joke. Listen, I, I promise I'm going to start Monday. That was what the running joke in the gym with all, all the members used to come in and say, oh, Gaffer, have you started Monday? And I was like, no, no, next Monday, next Monday. So this went on and on and on. One Monday, I decided to start. So I trained with Josh for the first week and I lost five pounds and I was buzzing. I felt brilliant. Um, so I put on Twitter, I've just, started, I've just started training, done my first week, lost five pounds. And I got loads of, you know what social media is like, it went pretty much viral and 
I got loads of messages saying, oh, I just can't find the motivation to start. So I sent this one guy a message saying, well, me and Josh are in a WhatsApp group because we are in lockdown at the time. Um, and he's given me a food plan and some exercises to do. And I've lost five pounds. Just jump in our WhatsApp group if you want. I didn't even know who this guy was. So yeah. he jumped in the WhatsApp group. I woke up next morning to 726 messages saying, can I jump Can I jump in your WhatsApp group? So all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, my God. It's like that Jaws moment, in it? I think we're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> um, so it just grew and grew and grew. And there's so many incredible stories now that are happening through the movement. You know, men, men that really, really struggled with their mental health. And if you go and see any doctor and you're struggling with depression or whatever, um, anxiety, the first thing that that doctor will say to you is get out and exercise. Yeah. So through exercise and weight loss, that then brings, you know, how you feel about yourself. You feel good, you know, you're buzzing. And, and mm -hmm. you know, we've got a motto in our gym. It, it's great to feel great. So mm. we've got now a group of lads all, all on WhatsApp groups, all encouraging each other, all talking. Um, we, we've had people that have been um, alcoholics. We, we've had one lad who's not had a drink for now eight weeks that's lost over a stone, um, addicted to cocaine that have jumped on. We've had people dealing with bereavement that, that mm. are now in the groups and, and it's really, really helping them. I've now lost 19 pounds. Um, Come back, so son. Exactly. So if I don't get a football job soon, I might be coming back. I don't know whether I'll make welterweight again. But um, <laughs> but yeah, it's just been a beautiful thing. And I've got to be honest, you know, and it's a big shout, but this is the most proudest thing I've ever been involved in because it's just coming out of love and nothing more. And we're helping so many people make such an important change. In I mean, the first lockdown for me, I've got to be honest, was absolutely sensational. I had my 40th birthday. The sun was out. I, you know, mm -hmm. I just retired. So I thought, I need a little break anyway. This is perfect for me. You know, couldn't come at a better time. It mm -hmm. was great. Got a, got, a, got a suntan, grew my hair back. I was like, wow. The second one was hard, really, really difficult. And then this mm -hmm. last one, again, it's just getting tougher and tougher as we go along. And I, I've, been, I've been training now nine weeks on, on this program. Um... And I had a little wobble a few weeks ago. I, I was in bed for two, three days, just couldn't motivate myself to get out of bed. Um, and loads of the lads on the group have been sending me messages saying, oh, thank you for motivating me, this, that, and the other. But they don't actually realize what they're doing for me and how they're helping mm. my physical and mental health. And it's been a massive, massive help for me. So I'm so proud to be a part of it. Even though I set it up, I'm, I'm far from the leader, you know, I, the, the saying in our group is nobody in front, nobody behind, everybody side by side. So we're all doing it for each other. And I can't wait till we can get out of lockdown and can meet up with all the lads. It's, it's going to be, it's going to be emotional. It's going to be epic. And like I said, this is the best thing I've, I've ever been involved in. I'm, I'm so proud of what the movement's becoming. So everyone, you're just getting them all working remotely. So everyone's just, that, that's the thing. Everyone's doing their own thing, yeah. but within a group. So yeah, we have yeah, some yeah. lads on there that are running 10K and I'm like, is this blowing Mo Farah we've got in our group or what? <laughs> and then there's other guys that are out walking the dog. You know, yeah. Josh puts in hit sessions that he that we set up our own YouTube ch channel and we have a beginner um, and an advanced and a, and, a, and a medium class on there. So it's for absolutely everyone. We've got a guy in there who's got a broken ankle who's just lost nine pound just from eating the, the food mm. plan. We're, we're not reinventing the wheel with the food plan. We're not, we're not trying to sell a diet. Yeah. All we're doing is putting the guys into a, 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 a calorie deficit. And anybody that tries to sell you anything other than a calorie deficit is doing just that. They're selling you things, you know, mm. so, so everybody, we get their BMI, we work out their height, their age and, and how many calories they need. And then we, we knock 25% off that. And then you're in a calorie deficit and these up, they have, I think six different options for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, three different snack options. It's just learning a new way of eating and, and changing a lifestyle. Like I said, we're not a four week fitness yeah. fab weight. You crash loads of weight off and then it's see you later. This is a life change for everyone. And it, it, it's as well as mental that is, is, is physical. We've just actually opened it up to the ladies today. It was a men's only group, but we've yeah. opened a, a, a women's section up as well. So they start next Monday. Um, which which should be fun. So yeah, it's, like I said, it's 
been an amazing thing and something I'm 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 really really proud of. Well, that brilliant. Kurt. No, I I'm going to get. I mean, I've got you into trouble now, haven't I? Because you have got to pick the wife up and look at the time. And I knew this had happened, unfortunately, because you can't I, talk I to you for five minutes. That's what I mean. But I could sit here all day and chat to you. But ju just to finally, I think you've got to think of one more professional sport that you should take on now before you know before you get too busy with football management. Maybe you could be a you could be a pro darts player or something. You've got to do another one. I fancy the darts, you know. But, yeah, but, why not? Well, now I'm losing all this weight. Maybe darts isn't for me. You know, I, I, I like yeah. the, the thought of a training camp as a darts player because they don't look like they, they do much running when I see them walk onto the hockey. So, what yeah, else then? Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'll be honest, it's crazy really because people always say to me, like with the football and boxing, God, is there nothing you can't do? And I'm like, I can't do anything. All I can do is football and boxing. Anything outside of that, useless. Can't change a tyre. I've not got a clue about anything. All I can do is play football and knock people out. Anything, anything outside of that, struggling. Don't do either of them when you see the Queen. No, I can't wait. Yeah, I forgot all about meeting the Queen. I go down to Buckingham Palace in, in, the, in the summer, so can't wait. Um, yeah, my family and everyone were, were buzzing to go down. You know what us Northerners are like? We don't get... We don't get to go down south very often, do we? So, <laughs> we'll, uh, we, I'm classing it as a holiday. Yeah, it's a proud day, though. Fair play to you. Well done. Can't wait, mate. Honestly, I'm so buzzing for, to do it. And, yeah, like, really, really proud day. Still kind of feel, is this actually happening? Um, mm. But, yeah, but I'm really, really proud. And for all my family as well, really. And to kind of rubber... I, I'm, I'm happy that I've got it for my achievements in sport. Mm. And to rubber stamp that, um, yeah, it's an amazing, it's an amazing moment. And... Yeah, it's you know me. I'm not, I'm I'm not normally speechless, but when I talk mm. about being honoured by the Queen, I don't really know what to say. Um, yeah. So yeah, really, really humbled.